Welcome. Thanks for joining me. The lost art of software design. Who would have thought the word software design would bring an audience like this? Blows my mind. So uh, let's start the story. Over the past decade, maybe two decades now, uh, many teams have thrown away big design up front. And this is a good thing. But there's lots of bad things associated with big design up front. It's very speculative, wasteful, etc., etc. However, many teams have thrown away lots of good stuff as well. How to think architecturally, design principles, practices, diagramming, modeling, all of that stuff, gone. The Agile Manifesto doesn't say don't do design, duh. But we kind of skip over that thing. And of course, you can't move fast with crappy code. And that's exactly what this is about. There's a great quote I like to use here by a friend of mine, Dave Thomas. He says this, big design up front is dumb. Doing no design up front is even dumber. This really epitomizes exactly what I've seen over the past couple of decades since the Android Manifesto was created. And just to be clear here, I'm not advocating that we go back to big design up front. But many organizations, many teams now are just doing kind of evolutionary design. They're doing their sprint, they're doing a little bit of design, delivering a bunch of features, doing some more design, delivering some more features. Go, go, go. There's a great book on this whole topic called Building Evolutionary Architectures that I thoroughly recommend people read. And there are lots of tips and tricks and tactics in this book to build architectures that evolve with your changing business requirements. But that's a significant decision in itself. Many of the techniques and practices you'll find in this book, choosing them is a significant decision, and that's now hard to change. And th that book talks about um, planned and unplanned evolution and how we make changes through guide and, uh, guided change. We need to make sure that's the case for both planned and unplanned events. So my goal for this session is to explain why some design up front is useful and to give you some tips on how to do it better and also in a lightweight way. So that's really my recommended approach when I work with teams. We want to do some design up front, but we're not going to get everything right. And we are still going to have to evolve our design. We're going to have to have some emergent architecture. There's going to be stuff we can't foresee. So let's figure out how to take that stuff into account better. Caveat time, when I use the word design, I'm only really talking about the stuff on the right, the technical aspects of software design. So for me, that's choosing technologies and APIs and frameworks. It's about modularity and decomposition. Now, all of the stuff on the left is super, super useful, and I definitely urge teams to do it, but that's not my area of expertise. So for those of you who don't know me, my name's Simon Brown. I'm an independent consultant. I specialize in software architecture. I'm the author of a bunch of architecture books. And if you go back to my past, you'll see I'm the author and co-author of a bunch of JSP books. <laughs> yeah, you can tell I'm a little older than maybe some of the audience here. Uh, what's interesting in my career is I'm, I'm kind of flying around the world and running these architecture workshops. And the people who hire me are in two camps. There's a camp over here that's like, we're doing waterfall, and we're just starting our, our Agile transformation in 2022. This has happened to me this year. Um, help us make our design practices more Agile. And then there's the other camp, which is like, we went Agile 10 years ago, and we're in a mess. We have no diagrams, no documentation, and people working from home is kind of making this harder. So, and it's interesting that you can solve both these problems with the same set of tools and practices and principles. So back to my workshop. My workshop is very simple. Here's two pages of requirements. Break the attendees up into groups of two, three, four, five people. Do some design, draw some pictures. The workshop exercise is literally phrased like that. And I give people about 60 or 90 minutes to do this exercise. And they have lots of chats and lots of conversations. And there's two iterations. Iteration one, we get diagrams like this. Yeah, typical software architecture whiteboard sketches. And some of these are horrendous. Let's be frank here, they're horrendous. Iteration two, some stuff happens, we all get better, and we draw some nice diagrams. We get some really nice diagrams after iteration two, and now you can see the solutions. And you're like, and? So I'm teaching people how to create nice diagrams? Well, yes, 
But actually, there's a little bit more to unpack here behind the scenes, because in order to get to nice diagrams, you need to do more work. And that's what this talk is really about. And I want to break it down into a number of different topics. The first of these is upfront design. So one of the questions I ask many of my clients and teams is, do you do upfront design? And many of them say no. And I'm like, well, why not? And they said, well, are we allowed to do upfront design? I'm like, what? You can do anything you want to. Like, it's a free world. You can do upfront design if you want to. And then I kind of quiz them more, like, why, why are you asking me this question? And so, oh, because we do XP and we don't think design is part of XP. I'm like, what? It is. OK. Uh, I get lots of people telling me that design, upfront design is not expected in Agile. This is going to be a common theme, by the way. Where did stuff like this come from? If you dig through lots of the early Agile literature, you'll find things like this. Uh, there's no big design up front. Agree. Happy with that. Most of the design activity takes place on the fly and incrementally. Simplest thing, possibly work, et cetera, et cetera. You dig through more things, and you get references to some of the more aggressive XPers up avoiding energy in, oh, sorry, they're, they're putting energy into avoiding upfront architectural design. None of these people are saying don't do upfront design, but they're not also promoting teams to do upfront design either. And it's really easy to misread what's not being said, you know, to make assumptions. Oh, the Agile people are, are not talking about design, so we shouldn't do design. That's not what this is about at all. These folks who put the Agile Manifesto together, specifically, of course, they have tons of experience between them. And they may be, even 20 years ago, in a different place during their career that they can make more informed design decisions without really thinking about these things, where we might have to put more effort into doing this consciously. So I kind of had this little thought experiment going on my mind. I thought, what happens if you take one of these super experienced agile people out of software and dump them in something else that they didn't know as well? And then this happened. So Ken Beck a few years ago said, I'm writing a book. And he posted a photo which is upside down, I, I don't know why. But it's a photo, it's an outline of the things he was covering in his book. And yep, somebody said, why, why are you doing this outline thing? Uh, my daughter has discovered that writing with flow and, and refactoring essentially is a better way to write. And Kent's reply was, I've done circa 20,000 words of software design. To write a book, I need to see the whole. So he kind of needed to zoom out to kind of figure out what was going on here. And I'm like, yeah, that's exactly me with software. I can't start doing lots of code, 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 TDD, 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 and get like 50,000 lines of code without stepping back to see the bigger picture here. Some people feel more comfortable stepping back to see the bigger picture before they start writing code, and other people feel more confident and comfortable stepping back maybe later. But the same principle applies, doesn't it? Sometimes we need to step back to kind of see the bigger picture here. And this whole agility thing requires a, a big toolbox of techniques and practices in order for us to build software. And I think we've forgotten about that stuff. I think we as an industry have forgotten and we don't teach people this stuff anymore. So that's just a simple question, like how do you design software? I was having this conversation with one of the other attendees earlier. How do you design software? Like, what? We just like go to a whiteboard and, and draw stuff. So we use a whiteboard. Well, what does that mean? What are you using the whiteboard for? Well, we draw boxes and lines. OK, what do the boxes mean? Oh, the boxes represent components. Oh, no, not that again. And we have to kind of go through this whole thing and get people to define the terms they're using. And ultimately, people end up saying, yeah, we just use our experience. Like, I've drawn a bunch of boxes on a whiteboard with some lines in between them. I use my experience. Like, that's fine. That's how we're doing a lot of this, of course. But if we aren't able to articulate the thought processes in our mind, how do we teach design to other people? Like, why have we drawn three boxes, not four or five? What's the reason? What's the justification for that? And it turns out when you point people to like wiki pages on decomposition, like, oh, wow, this is amazing. Didn't know this existed. You'll see people citing this thing still. It's about modules. But many people now take this same concept and apply it to services or microservices or Lambda things. 
Like all of this is exactly the same thing. It's, it's modularity. It's like how do you take a thing and decompose it into smaller things? And there's never a single right answer. You've got lots of options here, and each option has trade-offs. This is a lovely technique, CRC, Classes, Responsibilities, Collaborators. It's a great visual workshopping technique. I mean, don't apply it to classes. We don't sit around a table and define classes anymore. We're doing TDD or something instead. But you could take the same approach and apply it to components or modules or services or microservices. I think many people have the notion, the concept of upfront design as being different to what it actually should be about. I think many people are kind of thinking that upfront design is, let's aim to that perfect end state. Let's create a set of blueprints that we don't ever change like we used to do 20 years ago. And for me, that's not what we're doing upfront design for. There's a great image I like that talks about evolutionary design. Uh, it's from a blog post called Evolution, Evolutionary Design Beginning with a Primitive Hole by Josh Kirievsky. And I'm sure you've seen these images tons of times before. There's a, a one by Her Henrik Nieberg that starts with a skateboard and ends up with a car. Right? We can talk about that after if you want to. This is a much more reasonable image. Like if you want to build a great sounding guitar, this is how you do it in chunks. And you can see very clearly the steps between the iterations here. Right, and we've seen this a million times, so why am I showing you it now? The thing nobody talks about is version one. Like, how do we make version one? How do we get to version one and make it a sufficient set of starting point, a sufficient set of foundations that we can then iterate on top of? That, for me, is why we do upfront design. We're trying to put a starting point in place and, and get a general feel for the direction. The Agile Manifesto. The Agile Manifesto actually does talk about design. It's just kind of hidden away on that page two, the principles page. And it says this, continuous attention to technical excellence and good design enhances agility. So here you have the Agile Manifesto literally saying that good design is important. The other way to think about this, maybe slightly simpler, is a good architecture enables agility. And this makes sense, like from a gut feel perspective, this makes sense, doesn't it? If you've ever worked on a big, horrible, messy code base, who's working one? No, don't answer. <laughs> if you've ever worked on one of these big, horrible, messy code bases, it takes a long time to add features. You change some code here and stuff down here breaks and you don't know why because it shouldn't be coupled, but it is and oh, it's a mess. If you have a nice, I was going to say clean, if you have a nice, well-structured code base, You've got a high degree of modularity. You've got some nice hard boundaries around functionality. You change things inside those boundaries and you don't get that ripple effect, that blast effect through the entire code base. That allows you to move much more quickly. So for me, yeah, we're trying to put a starting point in place and set a direction. And I think having that starting point adds a lot of value. And this is applicable to all teams. For me, this is about technical leadership. And technical leadership applies to all teams of all shapes and sizes. Technical leadership also applies at multiple different dimensions across organizations. In the simplest case, you have your products team. They're building a bunch of code. That's it, nice and easy. In a more complicated environment, you've got a whole bunch of shared services, shared code ownership, multiple squads and tribes all trying to share, uh, all trying to change code on those shared services. Like, where does technical leadership apply now? Well, it applies on the shared services and uh, the features and the capabilities, uh, and maybe at hierarchies through the organization. So actually, this is quite tricky. So upfront design, super important. Yeah, let's talk about diagrams, because why not? Anyone who knows me knows I talk about diagrams literally all the time. So what happened to UML? Like, who uses UML here? There's a few hands. I bet they're all Dutch as well. <laughs> no, it's true. When I do my trials around the world, there are two countries that seem to have a higher UML usage than others, and it's the Netherlands and Germany. I don't know why. Never found out. <laughs> but I respect that, I must say. UML usage is generally quite low, except those two countries. Um, in many organizations now, you'll find where, uh, teams where nobody knows UML, and this is not going to get better. So why don't people use UML? Well, yeah, they don't know it. Okay, 
And that's an issue because universities and colleges know that we don't use it in the industry, so they've stopped teaching it. So that's, that's an issue. I did a workshop for a very, very well-known company, and they said this to my face. Wow. <laughs> Followed up literally 15 seconds later by that. <laughs> You'll be seen as old-fashioned. Well, thank you. I get lots of people telling me that UML is too detailed. UML is a language, okay, the specification is 800 pages. You don't need to use the entire language to draw some diagrams. But there is something about UML that kind of draws you into that detail. You're drawing a class diagram. You're modeling a relationship. Do you choose the black diamond or the white diamond? You're like, I don't know. So then you go to Wikipedia and look up aggregation versus composition. You're like, I still don't know what that means. And then you get the car examples. So you have a car and it has four wheels. If you blow the car up, do the wheels still exist? What? Like, I just want to draw a diagram. Uh, I get lots of people saying we don't want to use UML because we don't want to tell developers what to do. You do want to tell developers what to do. If this is your point of view, your developers need to be designing software, not being on the receiving end of some software architecture document. So this highlights some interesting cultural issues. The tooling, yeah, the tooling is horrendous. <laughs> Most of the UML tooling has traditionally been horrendous. Rational rows, yellow boxes. Yeah, I can see some people nodding. Yellow boxes, purple or pink borders. What? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and our old friend, uh, UML is not expected in Agile. Where did this come from? Again, same thing. You go dig through some of the old uh, Agile literature. Would it be better if we used a case tool to lay out the design? No. The design is more readily expressed, changed, and understood when done less formally with CRC. I like CRC, remember? Or on a whiteboard or a bar napkin. Thanks, Ron. Uh, <laughs> this guy here says it's a very elaborate waste of time. OK. I mean, he's got a point, sort of. His, 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 um, his guidance, by the way, for fixing this issue is just use a whiteboard. Now, I'm a big fan of whiteboards. I think whiteboards are fabulous tools for doing like pair architecting and collaborative design, and, and they're great for sketching out ideas. But I know how this works. Look, I have like thousands of photos at home of just use whiteboard style diagrams. This is not enough guidance. And it's at this point people say, well, hang on a second. Like, what's wrong with these diagrams? You keep banging on about these whiteboard diagrams being horrendous, but what's actually wrong with them? So during my workshops, I do this little perfection game thing. And I get groups to switch diagrams with another group. And I'm like, right, now I'd like you to do a review. I'd like you to rate the diagrams on a scale between 1 and 10. Find some things you like about the diagrams, please. And write all the stuff you think is horrendous. And here are a set of diagrams from a workshop I did just for the COVID lockdowns. This one's called a 7 out of 10. It's got a nice key in the corner, some little uh, empty folders. I don't know why. It's called a 7. This one here has lots of, we like doing this as software developers. Like We're going to stack these things to make this thing scalable somehow. <laughs> awesome. There's a little happy user here and a very shocked user here. This one here is funny. It's like components in JavaScript, components in .NET, 7. X to com. <laughs> Don't cross the streams. You can always tell when a, uh, a software developer has written or, or drawn a diagram because they make the database tiny. <laughs> so we do database stuff, but DBA world, code is more important. Seven out of 10, six out of 10. Pfft. These diagrams, I mean, they're, they're kind of amusing and everything, but they don't really tell you much about the actual solution. This whole seven out of 10 scoring thing is, is literally the score I see every single time. And it's because people don't have the pre-required knowledge to be able to actually judge these diagrams properly. They're like, yeah, that looks fine. It's better than the ones we got on Confluence. So it's all good. 
So then I, I get groups, so I say, well, swap the diagrams again, and now, now focus on the actual solutions. Can you answer these two questions? So do the solutions meet the drivers, the requirements, and the quality attributes? And if you were the bank in this case, would you buy any of these solutions? And they kind of go away, walk around for 15 minutes, look very puzzled, and come back saying, no, we can't answer that question, sorry. <laughs> I'm like, well, why can't you answer those two basic simple questions about the designs that your nice colleagues have been creating? And I'm like, well, we can't see the solutions. Yeah, exactly. If you can't see the solutions, you can't understand the solutions. If you can't understand the solutions, you can't evaluate them, you can't review them, you can't challenge them. And this is the big issue. This is why I put so much focus and emphasis on creating good software architecture diagrams. Many people say, well, none of that matters because the value's in the conversation. Oh my goodness, I hate this. I, I get the values in the conversation, and I'm a big fan of people having conversations rather than sending emails or chucking documents over a fence, but at some point, we need to be having the right sort of conversations. Where did this come from? Same thing, dig through the old Agile literature. Um, as a, you know, do you need a nice bunch of diagrams? No, uh, because the information you'll need will be communicated through the more effective medium of conversation. How's this working out for you? Now you're all working from home. Awkward. Um, yeah, I've had people say that these diagrams are, are all excellent as long as there is a conversation that accompanies them. Yeah. The problem is, if you can't see the solutions, you're, you're interpreting what you think is the solution, and then you're having conversations. And this whole value is in the conversation thing only works if you're able to have the right conversations. And you can't have the right conversations if there's ambiguity. That's the whole problem here. Superficial upfront design is kind of another topic here. Often I see groups, and they're talking about a diagram. And one person on that group, despite having just designed this solution together for like 90 minutes, will ask this question. Is this the microservices architect or a monolith? Like, what? Like, you've just spent 90 minutes doing design, and you didn't, come, you didn't answer this one basic question? And I've seen this. I've seen people look at these kind of high-level logical architecture diagrams, and they're just named boxes. And one person on the group thinks, oh, this is definitely a microservices or serverless architecture. And someone else is on, this is, this is like a Spring Boot monolith, obviously. And they never had that conversation. It's, it's really interesting. Uh, why is the ORM directly connected to the Angular front end? This is a bit specific. Let me take you back to one of those previous pictures. I know this is a Java conference. Imagine this is Java, not .NET. So we've got an AngularJS app at the top. We have a box down here labeled data storage, ORM, so Hibernate. Spring, JDBC, et cetera, et cetera. You'll notice there's a line going from Hibernate or whatever up to something in Angle. I'm like, cool, how do you do that? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> People not reviewing their own diagrams. Uh, similarly, is the web UI getting data from S3? I see tons of people who draw like a web app box and an S3 box or bucket and a line between them. I'm like, perfect. What's the web app? Oh, it's an Angular app running in a web browser. Perfect. How are, you, how are you accessing data out of your private S3 bucket? Oh, there's a JavaScript API, and we can pull data out, no issues. Perfect. Where are you keeping your security credentials? Oh, they're in the web page, aren't they? Yes. Not a good idea. And again, they're not kind of questioning these uh, things that they're, they're drawing. And the problem here is people are not engaging. They're sketching out a bunch of high-level boxes. Ten minutes, we're agile, we'll fix everything else later, and we'll move on. And this is not a good way to get to a good, feasible, implementable solution that you're not going to have to change lots later on. And I see this time and time again, and I've done this myself. I've kind of rushed into things and thought I understood what I was being asked to do, and it turns out I wasn't. George Fairbanks has a great book on architecture called Just Enough Software Architecture, and he says this in his book. A good architecture rarely happens through architecture in different design. This is jumping on a solution because of hype, trend, fashion, CV-driven design, resume-driven design, or that's what we always do here. Like, this is not a good way to make an architectural decision. We know those things, but maybe there's a bunch of stuff we don't know we don't know yet. And for me, having some degree of an upfront design activity is about uncovering the unknown unknowns. The way I like to think about this is relating it to the kind of typical S-curve of learning. So imagine you're learning a new skill. Initially, you have to learn some basics, some basic language, terminology, jargon, 
some basic skills and techniques, etc. And that can take some time to get into. After a period of time, things click and you get that accelerated learning curve where you can kind of learn new stuff quite quickly. And after a while, and maybe this is the 10,000 hours thing, after a while you kind of plateau because you're not learning new things that much more quickly. For me, the design process is kind of the same thing. I see many agile, in air quotes, teams doing design and kind of getting stuck right down here. They're doing a short amount of as design as they possibly can, but they're not really learning that much. I want to get people in this accelerated learning phase quickly, and I want them to stop doing lots of upfront design well before they start plateauing out. Big design upfront from 20 plus years ago was taking us all the way down the plateau, and then some more, like for another two years. And then we finally get to write some code if our project hasn't been cancelled. So for me, we want to do as much as possible in a short amount of time. Technology decisions are another angle on all of this. One of the things I've noticed over the years is that people are very allergic to putting technology choices on architecture diagrams, specifically when they're doing an upfront design exercise. And they give me a whole bunch of reasons, like the tech choices will clutter the diagrams, um, we don't want to tell developers what to do, et cetera, et cetera. But when people read and review the diagrams, a lot of the comments I get back are like this. If these diagrams had tech choices on them, I would be able to understand them as a developer easier. I'm like, yes, exactly. These are supposed to be development-focused diagrams, and technology is kind of a core part of all of this. So why don't people put tech choices on diagrams? I've heard all of the excuses as well. I had one organization say this to my face, we don't solutionize here. I'm like, what? That's literally not a word. They're like, yeah, our architects, our solution architects don't solutionize. What? What are your solution architects doing if they're not allowed to create solutions? That's just bonkers. And then I had another organization say something similar. Our architects are not allowed to do solutioneering. <laughs> like, I've never heard this word ever used ever before, but it was thrown in my face. Uh, again, we don't, want to, we don't want to impose a solution on the development team. You do. <laughs> Again, there's a whole, reason, a whole bunch of reasons why you need to get those developers involved in the design process. This is one of them. And I get people saying, well, we're a Java team, so it's obviously a Java solution. Yeah, not to everybody else in the organization, so maybe just put Java on the diagram somewhere, please. Um, so th those are some of the, kind of the issues that sit behind this whole diagramming thing. So we can leave it there, but that kind of doesn't answer any questions. I just ranted for like, 20 minutes. So how much upfront design should we do? Now, this is the essence of this. This is the lost art of software design. Imagine you're back at the office, and you're doing some design, hopefully collaboratively, and you're drawing some diagrams, hopefully nice diagrams. The questions you want to be able to ask yourself from your diagrams are these. Do the diagrams reflect what we think we're going to build and how we're going to build it? And are we confident that the solution we've drawn is going to work? That's it. That's literally all I'm interested in. If you can answer these two questions, you're done. Move on. Start writing code. We're not trying to decide everything. Big design up front from 20 plus years ago, we literally des designed everything right down to the tiniest of details of database schemas and whether columns in database tables were required or not. Right? We don't need to do that anymore. What are we trying to decide? I'm going to go back to Grady Butcher's definition of architecture, because I think this is a really nice way to frame this whole conversation. He says that architecture represents the significant decisions where significance is measured by cost of change. So there's a bunch of decisions you make, and some of those are expensive to change later. That's the thing that you want to focus on. From my perspective, it's really choices around technology. Once you start building your Spring Boot app, you're stuck with Java and Spring Boot. If you say, right, now, what we're going to do is we're going to split our system up into a bunch of services, and then different teams, Conway's all remember, different teams can use different languages to build their services. OK, so the significant decision there is not one around programming language, it's around structure. You've created a distributed architecture that lets you have flexibility in choice of programming language, but it's, it's much more complicated from an operational point of view, for example. So for me, many of these architecture decisions revolve around technologies, frameworks, and modularity and decomposition. Like stuff like 
white space versus tabs. Not architectural, honestly. And there's stuff in the middle. Martin Fowler said this a long time ago. I think there's a broad, a broad starting point. Sorry, let me start again. I think there's a role for a broad starting point architecture. Such things as stating early on how to layer the application, so modularity and decomposition, remember, how you'll interact with the database, so this is technology choices, et cetera, et cetera, and what approach you'll use to uh, handle a web server. So again, these are the kind of architecturally significant decisions, the things that once you have lots of code, these things become hard to change. In terms of this like diagramming thing, just use a whiteboard, the values in the conversation, this is not sufficient. And this is not a tooling issue. One of the questions I always used to get after my workshops is, if you let people use a tool during a workshop, do you think we'll get better diagrams? No. So during the pandemic, I took my workshop online and we were using Miro and Figma and Mural as a way to draw diagrams collaboratively. The diagrams I got back were equally horrendous, just in a tool. <laughs> And if you go to uh, Google and you, and you do a search for software architecture diagrams, you get stuff like this. You know, these look nice. Nice square or rounded edges, nice readable, legible fonts, nice straight arrows, corporate color coding, gradient shading. But they have the same issues. Like, why have we got so many colors? What do the different shapes mean? Why are some arrows unlabeled? What are all the acronyms? Th this is not a sufficient way to draw software architecture diagrams, because you can't answer these two questions. And we need ubiquitous language in order to describe things that exist in our software systems. I'm not talking about a domain-driven design ubiquitous language, but I'm talking about a ubiquitous language that we can use as software developers and architects to describe building blocks, architectural constructs, the things that exist in our code bases. And UML fixes many of these issues I'm talking about, of course, but people don't want to use UML. And so that's why I say this in many of my talks. A common set of abstractions is much more important than a common notation. UML gives you both these things, but then we get stuck with the black diamond versus white diamond thing, remember? As a good example of this, although this sounds like a step back in time, you know, if you look at an electrical circuit diagram, when you draw a zigzag, it means a resistor. That's super powerful. So this sounds like a step back in time. But there's a really good example of this in the real world, and it's a map. If we get two maps of Antwerp, put them side by side, they're going to show the same things, aren't they? That amazing central station that exists in Antwerp, the parks and the gardens and the big shopping street, and the metro lines and the tram lines, the two maps are going to show the same things, but they're going to look very different from a visual perspective, different colors, icons, symbols. How do we decipher a map? Well, there's a key in the corner, a legend. When you see this symbol, it means X. It's a really, really powerful yet simple concept, so I'm just going to steal that. And this is really what underlines my C4 model for visualizing software architecture. The C4 model for visualizing software architecture is essentially two things. Number one, it's a set of hierarchical abstractions. Software systems, containers, not Docker, components and code, and a hierarchical set of software architecture diagrams that map onto those levels of abstraction. So C4 is named after the hierarchy of diagrams, context, containers, components, and code. And the whole concept here is diagrams as maps. So you might want different levels of diagram that allow you to tell different stories to different audiences. I live in Jersey in the Channel Islands. If you do a, a Google Maps search for Jersey, you're going to get that picture. That's great if you want to know where the airport is and where the major roads are. If you've never heard of Jersey, it's way too much information. Like, but where's Manhattan? <laughs> no, other, other Jersey. How do you get its context? You zoom out and get to this map here, and Jersey disappears. On the flip side, you can zoom in. Keep zooming in, zooming in, zooming in. You eventually drop into Google Street View, which is a one-to-one -one mapping with reality. I want to do the same things for software architecture diagrams. I want different levels of diagrams that allow me to tell different stories to different audiences. Some of those audiences are going to be technical. Some are going to be non-technical. And the C4 model, it's notation independent. So you can use boxes and arrows, different shapes, different colors, or controversial opinion, you could use UML. I, I don't see people doing this, but you could use UML if you wanted to. Um, and maybe we'll, we'll um, see that more in the future. So coming back to diagrams again, because I love talking about diagrams, of course. The diagrams are a great visual checklist 
for design decisions. In order to draw that top level system context diagram, a system context diagram basically shows you the thing you are designing, the people using it, and the system integration points. In order to draw that diagram, guess what? You have to answer those questions. Like, what's the thing we are designing? What's the scope of the thing we're designing? What's the set of responsibilities or functionality that sits inside that box? Who is using our system? What types of things do they want to be doing? Only at a high level. And what system integration points do we need to provide? So if we send data to an external system, let's mark that on a diagram. If somebody sends us information, let's put that on a diagram. Answer those questions, and you can draw a system context diagram. So this is one of those diagrams from iteration two on my workshop. And now we can see that this group was designing this financial risk system. That's the box with the red border. They correctly identified two different user types. And by user types, I might mean roles or actors or personas or maybe real named people, up to you. And all of these existing systems around here have also correctly been identified. So this scopes that financial risk system. It's a really nice diagram. It's a great introduction. It's great for lots of audiences. It's a nice starting point for more stories. To go back to the Google Maps analogy, let's take that red box and pinch the zoom in. Now we can drop down to level two. Level two is a container diagram, not Docker, apologies. A container diagram basically shows you applications and data source that sit inside that software system boundary. So in order to draw the container diagram, the questions change. What are the major technology building blocks? How are we decomposing our solution into applications and data stores? What are they doing? So we're carving up responsibilities across those applications and data stores. What are the major tech choices? And how do they communicate with other building blocks? Answer those questions, and you can draw a container diagram. So now what we've got here is that red box has literally been zoomed into. We still have the people and we still have the external systems around the edge. But now you can see here we've got a couple of JavaScript React apps um, being front ends, UIs. We've got some Java command line apps doing some, in this case, batch processing. And we've got some data source. So this is a really nice, simple way to say this is what our solution looks like from a kind of architecture and development perspective. And it turns out that these diagrams should spark useful, meaningful questions. The whole point of drawing diagrams is good, good communication, and you want people to challenge your actual solutions, not ask you all these daft questions. If you show somebody an architecture diagram, and the first thing you ask you is like, why have you got blue boxes and red boxes? OK, there's, there's notation missing here. Like, is this a microservices thing or a monolith thing? If these basic questions are not evident, your diagram is not working. The questions I want people to be asking about your diagrams are much more like this. So imagine you've drawn a couple of Java applications and there's an arrow between them, implying some style of communication, but maybe that arrow is unlabeled. The question you should be asking is, oh, I can see you've got two Java apps. How are they talking to one another? Is this like a JSON over HTTPS REST type thing, or is it um, um, messaging? You know, what's the communication protocol? Or maybe you scan your eyes over this diagram, and there's a, a cylinder, which we all assume to be a database, of course, and it says MongoDB, and you're like, what? We, we're an Oracle shop. Why have you put Mongo into this solution? And then you can have a conversation. So for me, these diagrams are really about sparking meaningful conversations, not talking about notation. This allows us to have better design discussions. One of the f um, points of feedback I always get during my workshop is, OK, the diagrams look really nice. Hooray, awesome. And I, I say to people, but did you have different discussions than you did yesterday? Did you find you were having deeper design discussions? And the answer is, yeah. And, and I see this myself when I walk around the room, as long as I speak English. When I walk around the room, I can hear people having much, much deeper conversations. They're like, OK, so we got this thing here, and it needs to put data here, but it needs to do it through this thing. And, it, that, and they're kind of talking about how the design's actually going to work, which is refreshing. And that's good, isn't it? Because when we're designing software, we should be asking these questions. We should, should be spending our brain power doing design and work out complex design problems, not figure out how do we draw a bunch of boxes and arrows. Like the box and arrow should be easy peasy. 
Scaling teams, the side effects of this is scaling teams. If you have a good set of diagrams, you can have better conversations, you can now scale teams. You can take this information to more teams and you can take it to people outside of your team, outside of your organization even. And guess what? The diagram should provide useful, meaningful feedback. One of the things I always see during my workshops is people ask me this question. We're trying to diagram a microservices or serverless architecture, but our diagram is getting complicated. It's got tons of boxes and arrows. Help, how do we fix our diagram? And they're usually hoping I'm going to say, oh, all we need to do is this magic thing on the picture and all the complexity will go away. My answer is no. Change your architecture. If you are designing a complicated, event-driven, distributed architecture, your diagram should reflect that level of complexity. Don't lie. If you want a simpler diagram, create a simpler architecture, and we're done. There's a different question here about how do you diagram a really complicated big solution, and I can answer that later. But yeah, fundamentally, if, if you're not happy with the design you're getting, it's going to be reflected in the, in the diagram. So all of this diagramming stuff is super important because it does help us answer these two questions. The context and the container diagrams, with all of my no, uh, notational advice, definitely helps teams answer that first question. However, we can have the best diagrams in the world, and we still can't answer question two. We can have a gut feel uh, as to whether a solution is going to work, but maybe we need to do some more work. And of course, we know how to do this. Scott Ambler has a, has a great essay on agile architecture that you can summarize in one sentence. He says this, base your architecture on your requirements. So there's a bunch of stuff that drives the decisions you're making, focus on those things. Travel light, so be agile, be lightweight, do just enough, and prove your architecture with concrete experiments. This is kind of the missing piece of that puzzle, of course. A concrete experiment is nothing more than a stripe, a tracer. There's a whole bunch of terms we use for the same sort of thing. It's writing code to prove a hypothesis. How do you know which stripes and tracers to build? How do you know which proof of concepts to build? Risk. One of the big questions I get all the time is, Simon, we're doing an agile thing, but we're not sure how to deal with risk. Any suggestions? And my answer is yes. Go and read the Rational Unified Process book. Not all of it, because it's very big. But RUP is a, um, you know, no one really does RUP anymore, but RUP still lives on in things like disciplined agile delivery. But RUP is a risk-driven approach to delivering software, and it pulls the risky stuff to the start of the project lifecycle. Like, let's just do that. This is literally what the RUP book says. I mean, it says more words than this, but this is it. essentially the message. Identify and mitigate your highest priority risks. The problem with risks is that they are subjective in the same way estimates are. And the thing I don't want to happen is that one person who is the architect crafting up the list of risks through their eyes, because then you're not using everybody's collective experience on your team. And because we're all different and we have unique experiences and knowledge, we're all going to perceive different things as being risky with a particular solution or particular change in the existing code base. So this is why I have this technique I teach people called risk storming. And it's a really great, simple, collaborative technique for identifying risk. Bunch of steps. Step one, draw some diagrams, know how to do that. Step two, get a bunch of people together looking at the diagrams give them different color sticky notes. Different colors represent different levels of risk. Pink for high, yellow for medium, green for low. And then you do kind of a planning poker thing. In silence, look at the diagrams, identify what you perceive to be risky. Write it on a sticky note, keep it to yourself. You remove a lot of that kind of anchoring bias like you do with planning poker. And then you get a bunch of sticky notes on a diagram and you can do something with this information. If one person identifies a risk and everybody else misses it, we'll have a conversation. If two people identify the same risk with the same priority, you're good, write it down, move on. If two people identify the same risk with different priorities, have a conversation, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I see lots of teams now doing threat modeling. So this is becoming more important in kind of cloud native systems where we're pushing stuff on the cloud all the time. The Microsoft Stride approach is probably the one I come across the most. Um, threat modeling is essentially looking at diagrams and then Please don't ask me what stride means. It's a bunch of things uh, that I always forget. But basically, you're, you're looking at your solution from uh, different angles. And of course, you can do threat modeling on uh, those architecture diagrams as well. And it turns out that the C4 container diagram uh, shows you a bunch of risks. 
from a security perspective. And if you map that onto a deployment diagram, and there is a deployment diagram uh, defined on c4model.com, uh, then that will show you other risks related to just the deployment environment. One of the questions people always ask me is, how do, how do we show non-functional requirements or quality attributes on architecture diagrams? And the answer is don't, because it, they, they just don't really fit. And the other question is, how do we show architectural decisions on diagrams? And my answer is you don't. You use architecture decision records to document and describe decisions, including trade-offs and consequences. And if you're deprecating them and superseding them, you, you keep a, lo a, um, a log of all that stuff. But your diagrams show the outcome of going through that decision-making process. And of course, included in this stuff are going to be things related to risks and security and threats. So to wrap up this session, how much upfront design should you do? Who said just enough? You win. Yeah. So thanks. Bye. No. <laughs> sometimes you know what you're doing and sometimes you don't. So maybe this is the first thing you look at. If you're building a system in a big enterprise, it's like a system replacement or there's a, a new piece of regulatory thing come in, then maybe your requirements are fairly well understood and, and, and specified. If you're building a startup or a product company and you want to do A-B testing, et cetera, et cetera, then maybe you, it's more fluid. So in terms of the answer, I asked this question on Twitter a while back and uh, someone gave me this answer. I'm good with maybe a day for a one-year effort. So I, I'm assuming this is one day of design for a one-year development effort. I'm like, well, thanks. I mean, this might work for this person. It's probably not going to work for most of us in this room. And I think asking how long a design phase should be is a really, really poor question. And so I'm not going to answer it. I'm just going to make the assumption that you are going to do upfront design. And if that's the case, you can then ask a very different question that's much easier to answer. How do you know when to stop. That's a much better thing to focus on. And for me, upfront design, it's very iterative, it's very incremental, you're not going to get everything right first time. I think you should stop when you understand the things that are driving your design decisions. In this case, this is really the high level requirements, the important quality attributes, security, scaling, performance, etc the constraints of the environment you work in. These things are going to drive what you end up drawing on a piece of paper. Once you understand most of those things, you're good. If you understand the context and the scope of what you're building, you're in a good place. So in other words, if you can draw a system context diagram, you can answer that second bullet point here. If you understand your significant design decisions with regards to technology and modularity, you're good. So if you can draw a container diagram and it kind of makes sense, job done. If you have a way to communicate your vision to other people, you're done. If you can have meaningful conversations and other people can understand your solution or your change, you're in a good spot. And again, the C4 diagrams provide a way to do that. That's why I put so much focus on diagramming, of course. If you are confident that your design is going to work and it's going to satisfy the drivers, you're good. How do you do that? Architectural dry runs. There's a whole bunch of techniques out there, architectural evaluations. And if you've identified the important risks and you're comfortable with the risk profile, maybe you've done some proof of concepts to de-risk things or you've changed your architecture to, to de-risk your architecture, then you're good. And, and for me, that's what I'm aiming for. It's a very kind of goal-driven approach. Like, how long should this take? Well, a, a small amount of time, like days and weeks maximum, not months and years, but really that's what I'm aiming to do. How do you do all that stuff? It's the toolbox. There's a whole ton of different tools out there that we as software developers need in our toolbox. You've got kind of older fashioned workshops and interviews. You've got OOAD and CRC and there's tons of stuff in DDD and event modeling and event storming and impact mapping. There's a whole bunch of kind of analysis and design techniques now. You've got formal and informal architecture reviews like ATAM and Tara. You've got my risk storming thing. You've got architecture dry runs. You've got threat modeling. You've got my C4 model for diagrams and architecture decision records. There's literally a whole bunch of stuff out there that exists that we should be using. These are tools we need in our toolbox. So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to create a good starting point and set a direction, but we're not going to get everything right. 
So I do appreciate we are going to have to do some evolutionary design as we learn, as we progress, as we pivot. My closing point is really this. Adopt an agile mindset. You know, you need to do what works for you. There's a bunch of tools here. Try them out. If they work for you, fantastic. If they don't, find some other tools. But there's no standard common answer to this question of how much upfront, uh, how much upfront design should you do. But for me, focusing on goals is a better way to approach this. So that's me. Thank you very much. Enjoy your evening. Thank you.